Um, I'm Zach Costello, um, I'm a PhD student here. So the first thing we're doing is, um, today is simulate, um, but most of the tools that are used in industry for ABS, Microsoft, they're expensive, so the amateur typically might not have access to them unless you have an industry contact. Um, and there are other tools available, but again, they can run up a lot to a lot of money. Um, so when I was kind of looking into the talk, I kind of set a design challenge, which was, can you actually, where can you get to with free software? Um, which ended up being quite interesting. So um, what can they do currently? Um, where in the near future do you think they will be? What's currently available? Um, and are they actually a match for the commercial software? Where are they lacking? Um, and I was hopefully going to have try and find uh, open source software, if possible, just because we can modify it then to suit our needs. Um, so um, I'll be kind of mixing it in with some design fundamentals to sort of set the stage for some later talks in the day. So today we're doing a talk on more um, involved PA architectures, <coughs> and Derek will be doing some paramount related material as well. Um, so this will sort of give you a refresher if nothing else. Um, the files that are used in this, they'll be uploaded to the website if you're curious, um, or if you want to improve on them, because that's part of the idea of this. Um, so I'll be, the part of the idea was to start creating some learning tools, um, because at the moment they are available, but they're on uh, packages such as ADS, which is great if you've got access to them. But for an amateur, I mean, unless you have 10 grand, you're not going to be able to use the learning tools. So this would be available to all, ideally. Um, so uh, the software I found, um, the most promising, is called Quux. I think that's how it's said. Um, quite universal circuit simulator. Um, so there are several branches of it, um, but they're all essentially the same idea, which is, um, has a graphical interface, um, very similar to the commercial uh, design tools in terms of layout, how you use it, etc. Um, I chose to use Quark Studio, which is closed source, but it's the thing I can get working in the shortest amount of time. Um, but hopefully in the future, the original Quark um, version will <coughs> the one that we can go forward with. Um, I also uh, looked into using uh, SimSmith, which is a great Smith chart tool, and so you can design matching networks, etc. Um, and then Quux integrates GNU Octo, which is uh, the matlab like um, program, um, very powerful. Um, so seeing if we could combine these programs, can we get something approaching um, AES? which is the one I use a lot. Um, so a uh, bit of um, PA basics. So uh, I'm going to talk about FET, so field effect transistors, not BJTs, but it's applicable to a certain extent as well. It's just the underlying device physics are slightly different. Um, so a uh, few things. Um, in terms of um, some of the stuff we'll be talking about, uh, when I talk about intrinsic and extrinsic planes, uh, intrinsic will mean the current generator equivalent circuit as we model a FET transistor. Um, so that's within all the device parasitics. So there's an output drain capacitance associated with the FET. Uh, there are also inductances associated with bond wires, the actual package itself. Um, so that would be the yeah, outside of the band, still think this would be in. Um, so just to clarify, um, and you can see the effect of that on the Smith chart here. So uh, what the device sees here gets transformed once it goes through this parasitic network. Um, so ideally, you'd be working with the device plane because that's what the uh, transistor is actually seeing. Um, so basics. Um, just to explain GCHB curve in case we just look on. Um, so, um, this is a relatively ideal 
um, IG curve, uh, we make a couple of assumptions. Um, first thing is that uh, our knee region, uh, we're assuming it's instant, so this would be at zero volts. Uh, we have a saturation region, um, which the current's constant, round about in an ideal case. Uh, we have a breakdown voltage here, um, and then we have, let's see, that's saturation region, classy. We have um, different gate voltages that are applied. We um, have that saturated value is controlled via that. Um, and then another important point is the pinch off voltage. So as we reduce gate voltage, um, just to clarify, gate voltage here, train voltage plus <laughs> two. Um, yeah, as, as we reduce that, at a certain point, it will turn off. Um, so uh, one of the things about this is we're assuming this new region here is small um, and therefore perfectly linear. Um, so by linear, I mean an increase in the gate voltage will produce a um, consistent increase in the output current. Um, so um, just to give you an example of a real IV curve. Um, this is a simulated ADS. So I used a Corvo 10 watt GAN device um, for a um, my MSC project actually. So I designed a PA for um, it to replace a current key that's in um, the such rescue transponders in um, the Galileo constellation. Um, so as you can see, the knee region here for GAN devices in particular quite a soft knee region, so it's not immediately clear um, where you can say the knee region has ended. Um, and also the saturation, you can see that there's a slight sl um, slope. It's not ideally straight. Um, this is just the power dissipation. So uh, beyond this point, the um, dissipation is potentially too large for the transistor to handle. Um, uh, this is just where I biased it for a low, low bias point, um, which I'll just briefly cover later on. Um, but just to give you an idea, and this is um, yeah, this is all simulated using a model in ABS, um, but obviously you can measure as well the balance of the simulator and one, you don't have to do that uh, intentionally. So um, just to again go over theory, um, the output voltage that we have um, you've got to convert, sorry, output current, you've got to convert that to voltage. So you need to terminate the circuit with a resistor to present an impedance to our network. Um, one thing that is a common uh, misconception potentially is that we don't match for the conjugate maps match. Um, we match for power, hence load line matching. Um, so normally you'd think that okay, maximum power transfer theorem um, doesn't match the conjugate. That's sometimes applicable in the input, and for a linear amplifier, perfectly linear, you could argue that's okay, but that's ignoring some of the device physical limitations, <coughs> such as breakdown voltage. So if you match the conjugate match, um, you find, in most cases, the device will reach breakdown before you can actually um, take advantage of the entire swing. Um, and also, say in your mobile phone or a handheld radio, your drain bias is also limited. You ne won't necessarily be able to take advantage of the entire voltage swing there. So, um, conjugate match, not actually best if you want to extract the maximum power out of your transistor. Um, so instead, we match the load line. Um, so this is just the equation, not too uh, that heavy. <laughs> um, so this uh, divided by two is just because your sinusoidal, if you have a sinusoidal input, your sinusoidal output current, um, the amplitude is just half of the input. Uh, divided by two. Um, uh, another thing to cover: biasing, so it's your gate bias. Um, and this is where it starts to link you with the other talks, potentially. Um, so, class A, 
that's where you extract the maximum swing. So from your maximum current to ideally uh, the maximum amount of uh, DC power that you're inputting at your drain. But you can reduce this um, gate voltage, and what will happen is your voltage waveform, the output, um, will stay the same for your current waveform, will have a reduced conduction angle. And what you can do from, uh, use from that is your efficiency can increase, um, which they will cover um, some more advanced architectures that can um, enable you to actually have more efficiency. But uh, I won't cover that, um, this is go on a bit. Um, so uh, this is just a um, ADS example. Um, it's actually a template that they provide. Um, so again, if you didn't have access to ADS, you wouldn't have access to this. And that's just showing a class A load line. Um, so I biased it. Uh, this is a, with a one volt new voltage. So the device just switches off at this point. Um, so there's a physical limitation, but the uh, current uh, voltage swing is as large as it can get. So it's linear, um, but it's not very efficient. Class A amplifiers are 50% efficient in the ideal case, which it never is. Um, this is a bias point uh, class B. Um, so the idea here is that half your conduction angle um, is where the device is off. So you get a um, half rectified sinusoidal output uh, waveform. Um, so how do you do that? Because this generates harmonics, um, that retrolinearity. The idea is you present a um, your impedances to your input and output, but you also terminate the harmonics. So um, in the classical um, architectures that I've described, class A, class B, class A, you don't actually need harmonic terminations to class A, because theoretically it's not generating any harmonics. But at the other um, around five classes, you would short out the harmonics using harmonic terminations. So, um, in the example circuit I will show you, I've just used a tank circuit, so parallel art LCD network. Um, but you'd also translate that to microstrip components um, if you were actually designing a PCB. Um, and then you would match the fundamental, um, which you would use, uh, for example, Sim Smith as an example. Um, and just to point out, I'm sure you all know that. You, for most PA design, the standard is you match 250 ohms. So the impedance you present here, ideally at the current generator plane, as I explained earlier, um, to extract the maximum power out of your transistor, I probably going to be quite far away from 50 ohms. Depends on the device you're using, but they're normally quite low impedances. Um, so you have to transform this impedance that you present 250 ohms. Um, and also, just to point out, uh, you've got a Passes on the input and output to remove the DC uh, from your load or prevent it from entering the load. Um, and you'd also have an RF choke to present the AC voltage from uh, shorting into your bias network. So all the AC power, hopefully, uh, goes to your load. So um, before we get into that, I just want to show you. Um, so this is Quark. Um, so I've just created a ideal transistor model. Uh, it's heavily based off a Keysight uh, example, but the idea is we can build on this, hopefully. Um, so I've just uh, had a current generator. So this is a voltage control current generator, normally what we model the transistor as. It's not actually a current generator. It's a current sink, which is you're supplying the power. It's not creating anything. Um, it's converting DC energy into RF energy. But we model it as a current generator. Uh, this section here, this is just to rectify the voltage, um, which you need to do. And then here, we've got uh, ideal diodes. This is just a diode equation. Um, and using this, um, we can set the new voltage. Um, so if I have a new voltage of zero volts, 
we can now simulate uh, our DCRD curve, like so. And we've got an ideal DCRD curve, which normally you have to pay quite a lot of money just to get to that point. that I didn't get time to add, but is to then add the low line. Um, more interestingly, um, so this is a class, um, this is still a class A condition. Um, as you see, I'm not supposed to generate any harmonics, so I haven't terminated them. Um, but I'm just injecting an AC signal into here. Transient simulation, um, that's uh, one of the limitations, uh, I'll go into that later, but that's one of the limitations of this software. Um, that so far, the, you can only do one simulation block at a time. In ADS, you can do them all at once, um, which will slow your time development time because you've got to create individual workbenches for each uh, simulation. Uh, but this is just to show that it does, in fact, work. You can extract the uh, waveforms out. Um, so this is the slightly more interesting one. So um, it's the same, but we're using the harmonic balance simulator. Um, harmonic balance simulators are what is typically the standard now because it allows for you to predict non-linear behaviour if your model allows it. Um, so as you can see here, I've just created a circuit to resonate out the. Uh, one, at one gigahertz, all the harmonics, just ideally, leaving just the fundamental to be deposited into our load. Um, and I kind of worked around the fact that you can't, uh, it's not that easy to present a complex load. That's another limitation of this. Um, so I just used a, um, a power source, but with no actual power being generated, so it's just an impedance. Um, so if I simulate this, the slight problem here is that um, you can actually, uh, and this is one of the great things about this, um, which gives it potential, is that you can write update scripts and integrate them directly into here. It won't let me this a little on this computer, unfortunately. Um, but an example of this that I um, wrote is, as we see here, um, from the harmonic balance simulation, um, Unfortunately, it outputs in the frequency domain. So we can see our harmonic components here. So at the kind of current generator plane, here, we can see that we've got a DC component, our fundamental, and then our current waveform has even harmonic components. Um, one of the things, just as a practical side, is that you don't really need to go to the high harmonics when, um, or oh, it's very, very difficult to um, uh, resonate out the high harmonic. So you normally would only match to the third harmonic, um, really, maybe the fifth, if you're ambitious. Um, but you can see that after um, our DC block, our DC component is removed, but the rest of the waveform stays the same. Um, so the update script, um, this is where it's actually quite useful because you can essentially without actually having to know that much coding at all, um, you can start to do some interesting things. So this is just a script I wrote. Um, and this ideally, normally, it would directly integrate with Clux. So you'd load the script, you click simulate, and it would just automatically do it for you. You don't have to open update <coughs> separately. Um, so this just converts as an inverse FFT. So it converts from the frequency domain back to the time domain. So we would actually be able to see the waveforms um, that the circuit has produced. Um, so at that point, you're starting to get some actual useful design information. Um, but the only thing is, at the moment, this is an ideal model. Um, so it's great that teaching you can modify the parameters, um, probably make it a bit more streamlined. But you can learn quite a lot about the operation of the transistor. Um, but uh, this is where some of the 
the uh, limitations are currently. So, Quirk Studio it has the following simulation. It doesn't have um, some of the uh, simulations like an envelope simulation, uh, which AES has. So that's more efficient for um, certain signals um, where harmonic balance would take a lot of time. Um, so that's something that potentially is missing. And how are we doing time? Oh, we didn't actually. Uh, Ten two. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Um, yeah, so um, it does have harmonic balance, but it's somewhat limited. It's a lot slower than ADS. Um, but there's another branch that integrates um, spice models, which I'll mention briefly. But also um, external um, harmonic balance simulators, which are a lot more powerful. Um, that's one of the limitations of this and the original Quox branch. Um, so one of the future things, and I think it will come relatively soon, is it will have more powerful harmonic balance simulation. Um, for things like filter design, it's all you can. It's got a filter tool straight out of the box. So you, if you didn't want to, you could just <coughs> generate a filter and it would do all for you if you really wanted to. Um, but it has S branch simulation, so. For linear amplifier design, that's great. Um, the only problem with S parameters is they're linear. So, um, also the ratio measurements. So, your uh, you don't know what's going on internally with your S parameter measurements. It's a black box, which is great for your company because you can see inside your design. But for sort of the amateur radio or designer, you want to know a bit more, ideally. Um, but one thing to demonstrate that, why <coughs> it's linear or a uh, result of it. Um, so this is a <coughs> work, um, a record Sam Winton did here at Cardiff uh, a while ago now. But, um, so this is um, S parameter measurements on a non-linear model that he constructed. Um, but as you can see, the extrinsic and intrinsic models <coughs> differ. Um, but also the reverse and forward measurements, so the measurements to, to get your S parameters, they differ as well. If it was reliable, they would be the same. So it's a way of illustrating that S parameters, the fundamental limitations if you're designing with a non-linear device, such as a transistor. <coughs> um, so that's where really the free software is lacking at the moment, which is the non-linear models. Um, we have spice models, which are okay. They're not open source; they're copyright, but they have that has some advantages. But really, for involved design like what they've been talking about at the moment, you can't really do that. Um, but you can do your basic power amp design. So if you just wanted to build an amplifier and um, linear class A, for example, you could probably do that in the software as long as you had some way of measuring. Device. Um, so uh, one of the things, I mean, some people probably don't know it already know about this, but the uh, SimSmith tool. Um, I just thought people should know about this. It's really good. Um, so so this is a, just a JavaScript program, um, but it's. Free, similar in capability to ADS's Smith Jar matching tool, so but it's completely free um, and it's useful for other RF design applications as well. Um, so you, you've got your load and what you're matching to, um, and you can just introduce elements. So such as that, gone to the passive side of the Smith Jar, um, and you can transform your repeaters as such. Um, it's even got a little. Uh, Oops, it's all to see roughly if it will match or not. Um, that's quite a powerful tool, actually, and it's completely free. Yeah. Um, before, some of the software I've seen is quite expensive with the same vulnerability. So, um, in terms of free software, <laughs> that's actually very useful. And I think it's quite new, but it's worth knowing about. 
Um, so just a, another comparison, but yes, um, I just quick, uh, did a quick comparison of the line calc tools. So that's if you when you when you've um, in using Smith actually designed your matching networks, um, you want to convert those to <coughs> transmission lines, say for Microsoft, for example. Um, use that using the line calc tool ideally. So that's just applying uh, equations that you can find in the book, but all done in a nice little tool. Um, so uh, the comparison I did, I just used the Rogers um, 5880 laminate. Um, this is the Quark Studio transmission line calculator. They've all got all the Quark's uh, variations have tools in their face. So, um, but you can see the actual transmission line that you come out with, the sections are very similar, so you're going to get similar performance. Um, so that in itself is quite useful. Um, so you can design matching networks, present the right means to your devices, and convert those to real circuits. Um, using these tools, and it's completely free. Um, uh, just a little thing, hit this time. Okay, drop enough. Um, modeling, so the types of models. You've got physical models. So that's a, uh, the most common type is compact modeling. So that's what you get in your commercial software. You buy a compact model. It just works out the box. You drop it into your simulator. Gives you a good nonlinear or to predict the accurate device behavior. Uh, behavioral models, that's something we work on at Cardiff, that's based on measurements. So it's limited by your data set, but um, you can directly measure it. And it's based on equations that match the um, physical behavior you've actually observed. Um, normally they're stored in a table, and then it uses a lookup table. So it just finds the right values and then interpolates between them. Um, so, uh, conclusions. Um, there are some useful free tools. Um, it's being improved, but there are limitations with regards to PA design. Um, I found non-linear devices, devices are the main problem. Um, and if you're not familiar with them, um, this is part of the reason that if you have a spare minute to contribute or suggest anything for what I've done here on Quark Studio, um, we could create some learning tools. So the steep learning curve can get less steep. Um, ideally. <laughs> um, so any questions?